Welcome to The Details with Elliot Connie and Adam Frower. This is a podcast where we examine the intersection between solution-focused brief therapy and current topics going on in the world. And we do this because we genuinely want the world to be a better place. So enjoy and come examine the details with us. So Adam, funny story. The last podcast we ended, because we've been talking about such heavy stuff, social injustice, the American election, all of the crazy stuff going on in the world. I said, man, I hope someone steals a giraffe so that we can talk about something completely different in our next podcast. Maybe we should talk about something different. We we made a commitment when we started this podcast that we would have real conversations about what's really going on in the world or and how that impacts or intersects with solution-focused brief therapy. So that's what we're doing. And right now we're in a real tumultuous time in human history and the American election is really happening. So I imagine we're going to continue to talk about it going forward, at least for the next few weeks. But so funny, somebody sent me a video on Facebook. In essence, the tag on Facebook said, Elliot, it's not a stolen giraffe, but it is a ghost driving a tractor trailer. And there's this viral video going around of stop traffic, police everywhere, and a tractor trailer driving all over the road with no driver. So we can't talk about a giraffe, but we can talk about if 2020, we've had wildfires, we've had celebrity deaths, we've had another round of wildfires, we've had social justice, we've had political upheaval. If we now have ghosts driving tractor trailers, like <laughs> 2020 is coming strong, man. Like 2020 is coming with a vengeance with its life lessons and craziness. And I couldn't help but watch that video and laugh and be like, there is no reasonable explanation on how this tractor is doing what it's doing other than a ghost driving it. And in any other year, I'd be like, well, maybe the gas pedal got stuck or whatever. But in 2020, I'm like, yeah, makes sense. Ghost driving it, got it. Like, like there's no reason to doubt that there's actually the phenomenon of a ghost driving a tractor trailer in 2020. Did you see that post? Did you see somebody's? I did. I did see that. And I did. I did laugh. I also saw a meme where there was this super twine bridge. It was like this bridge made out of twine with twigs across. And the caption was 2020 is so close. We're right at the very end. And it was just like, we just have to make it over this, this bridge made of twine and sticks. And, uh, and so I kind of I kind of had to laugh because it just kind of feels like we're holding on for dear life, right? Because we just got to like step from one twig to the next and just right. hope the twig doesn't snap. Well, Adam, I'm stepping on one twig to the next right alongside you, hoping with all my hope that this twig does not break and we get out of 2020 in one glorious piece. Well, and I think you kind of made a nice transition there to kind of what we were thinking about talking about, right? And it's this idea... I'm right there next to you. And in a normal time, I would be really grateful that you're standing right next to me. But on these twigs, I think maybe if I get to go first and then you come, you come one step behind, that's probably, we probably both don't want to step on the same twig at the same time. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So <laughs> let's introduce the topic that we, we were talking about going over today. And I think I want to talk, like, we're going to talk about compassion, why compassion matters how compassion influences what's going on in the world today, and also how it could influence the solution-focused world in general. So I saw this quote by Brene Brown. I'm not going to pull it up, so I might butcher it. Brene Brown said, you have to have the ability to listen to someone as if what they're saying is true, instead of trying to like run it through your truth, right? There's some quote that she had you have to believe someone's you have to believe someone as they describe their world as they see it and not try to convince them that you are right in the way that you see it basically i think that's such a powerful powerful message because we have to learn and i can't even tell you how often i see like social media arguments about someone's perspective i got into an argument with people close to me because I grew up in a suburb of Boston, Massachusetts, a place called Franklin, Mass. And Franklin, Mass is a very white, Irish, Italian, Catholic community. In my graduating class of, I think it was like 208 was my graduating class, there were three African-Americans, myself and then two other guys that were in the class. So this is 
greater than 98% white. And in the current landscape in which we live, these people that I grew up with and I've been around for a whole long time are actually saying and posting content on their social media pages that is very racist. And I experienced it as very racist. I experienced a lot of discrimination while I was growing up. I experienced a tremendous amount of overt discrimination, like someone telling me that you're black, thus you can't do such and such. And I experienced a lot of covert racism. And now realizing and finding out that some of the people that I grew up with were involved in that, I posted on social media how hard that was. And people who are from Franklin and, and or currently live in Franklin were like telling me that I'm wrong, but I'm not. Like you, you have no right to tell me that my worldview is not accurate to me. And the simple truth is, even though we were there at the same time, and let's say I fictitiously name somebody Bob. I don't want to identify anybody. I don't want to like insult anybody, but let's say I fictitiously identify somebody named Bob. Bob and I might've gone to high school together and we lived in the same Franklin, Massachusetts at the same exact time, but we didn't live in the same place because of my cultural background, my ethnicity, my race, all of that. We didn't live in the same Franklin. There were like two simultaneous Franklins. I lived in the one that included discrimination I lived in the one that included bigotry. I lived in the one that included limitations. And Bob lived in the one that included belonging because he fit the mold. If you were white, Irish, Italian, Catholic in Franklin, Massachusetts, everything was made sense. Like everything was built for you. If you were black and from Chicago and your family had just arrived in Franklin, it wasn't a warm, accepting place. And we have to develop the ability to listen to someone as if their view of the world is accurate to them, instead of telling them that like, no, you're wrong because it doesn't fit with my view of the world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think what's really fascinating about that is that where I grew up, it was predominantly white, predominantly middle-class. And so I was on the flip, side of that. And my religion, right? I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Some people call us the Mormons because that was the predominant view of the area and that was the predominant experience of the area. It wasn't actually until recently that I started to realize that because that was the predominant view that maybe not everybody felt like they belonged. I had friends who didn't belong to our particular faith, or I had friends who weren't white, but I just took for granted that they felt just as welcome and felt like they belonged just as much as I did. And it wasn't until pretty recently, actually, that I was describing where I grew up. And I said to the person that I was describing, I said, you know, I come from a pretty homogeneous area. And then I stopped and I thought, actually, I don't. I don't come. There were a lot of people, for whatever reason, a lot of Polynesians who came and, and lived in, in Utah where I lived, right? So a lot of Samoans, a lot of Tongans. And I realized that we didn't interact much. They tended to associate with one another and we tended to associate with one another. And so my experience was an experience that was a homogeneous experience, but that's just because my group and their group didn't really mingle with one another. And so where I was thinking we were a welcoming, we were a generous, we were a kind group of people, they may have had a totally different experience of that, but I wasn't taking that into consideration. I was only seeing my experience through my eyes. Yeah, you know what, what that made me think about is I remember the very first time I talked to you about the solution focused community itself. And I voiced like, because you were the first person I voiced out loud, like, I don't know that I feel welcomed in this community. I don't know if I'm experiencing the warmth and welcoming in this community that I think is appropriate for like a compassionate group of people. And I remember you saying like, it's interesting you hearing me say that because you did feel that warmth and that welcoming. And one of the things that is interesting is, and I guess this is a question I'd have for you. How did you listen to my reality, even though it didn't correlate to your reality, but still validate my reality? Like, how do you do that? Because you belonged to the group because 
you didn't have some of the outlying factors that I had that made them exclude me. So here I am telling you like, Adam, this is an exclusive group. I experienced so many people telling me that I was wrong. How were you able to validate my experience as true, even though it didn't fit fully with your lived experience? It's hard to answer that question from the perspective of in the moment, because I think, I think one of the things that we know about memory and, and one of the things that we know about how we even recount memory is based on our current situation, right? Our current lived experience. And so it, I'm sure that my answer is colored by the fact that you and I have become really close since that time. And we were close then, but I think we're much closer now. And so I think part of it is, you know, I've, I've had time to just get to know you, but I think in the moment, one of the things that kind of stood out to me is I knew that when we went to a conference together, there was a polarizing experience, I think, where I could recognize that some people were very, very fond of you and were very welcoming. And there was another experience where there was almost like an avoidance. I could see a polarity. So I could see evidence, I think, of it existing. But again, I think sometimes we tend to overemphasize the positive. And so it would have been an easy experience to say, well, just ignore those people who are unkind or who are unwelcoming and come over here where there is the opposite experience. But I think that because we were also at a similar place in our professional development, I didn't feel like I had the authority to say, well, just come over here. I just kind of had to stand next to you and watch and say, I can see that that's happening. I don't know why it's happening. I don't know what, I don't know why it's happening to you and not to me until it did start happening to me, but probably because of you. Sorry about that. (laughs) (laughs) And so I think really it was just, I just had to take you at your word. And once we started doing things together, I I could see that it was indeed playing out that way. So I guess I just had no reason to not believe you. But I, I just find that interesting, right? So like in our current political landscape, if I were to say, I don't like candidate A, because they don't have an alignment with the America that I want to live in. Their policies and their rhetoric or whatever are not in line with how I want to live. How do we get away from the place where people tell me that I'm wrong instead of, well, from your perspective, that probably makes sense. I think that's such a good question. And I think one of the things that comes up for me as I listen to that is Daniel Siegel, who writes and talks a lot about the brain and what goes on in the brain. And one of the things that he has talked about is this idea of the middle prefrontal cortex. So basically right here in the front of your forehead, right? And that part of your brain is a really important part of the brain. And one of the reasons that it's important is because there's an emotional part of your brain that's kind of back further and deeper down. And the amygdala is that place where it's typically it's associated with that fight or flight, right? Something different comes up to me. And historically, we would say there's a fight or flight or sometimes freeze response. And so difference is perceived as something alarming or something that I should be afraid of, something that I should run away from. But what happens is when we connect, when we can pause for just a moment, and we allow our prefrontal cortex to kick into gear, right? That's where the logic and the reason takes place. We can pause for a minute and say, is it, is it worthwhile for me to be afraid? Is this difference something that I should run away from? And that prefrontal cortex, one of the things I think that's really valuable is that if we can slow that response time down, it gives us time in essence to say, Besides that initial difference that I see, where are there points of similarity or where are there points of agreement or where are there points where we can come together? If we just base our reactions and our interactions with each other on that emotion, we will forever be basing it on stereotypes. We'll be forever basing it on physical appearance. We'll be forever basing our decisions on stereotypes and quick judgments. 
it's not until we take the time to say, wait a second, there are probably some differences, but where do we overlap? Where do we agree? Where do we, in some sense, where can I have compassion for you? And where I can have compassion for you is where we overlap. And I can say, you're a new professional, just like I'm a new professional, or you're somebody who's trying to figure out how to get into this profession just like I am, or you're a guy just like I'm a guy. We may have a lot of things that are different. Our race is different. Where we grew up is different. The way that we behave is different. But if I can slow down and I can say, but where are we the same? Now I can act from a compassionate place because I can say, you must be experiencing something like I'm experiencing. Yeah, I think that's so powerful. And it's so funny. As you were talking, what I was thinking about was one of my favorite movies as a youngster was Independence Day, which was like my first experience, like a blockbuster movie, you know, like the whole world wants to see this movie. And there's a speech given in that movie by the actor playing, you know, the president. And he's like, mankind has a different meaning today. And I actually believe one of the greatest things that could happen right now is an alien attack. And given the way 2020 has been going, I'm not ruling it out. <laughs> But what an alien attack would do is all of a sudden we are one species mm. that has to defend against this alien attack. Because right now, I think you're spot on. Like we're so busy focused on differences that we don't even give each other grace. And it's so hurtful. Like I have been so deeply hurt by certain interactions. Like I was thinking, I had an interaction with someone on social media where I posted somewhere that I thought the N word is the most offensive word ever. Yeah. And me saying that angered someone who tried to tell me that that's not true. And there was a, a derogatory word used to Jewish people that's equally bad, if not worse. And I was so offended by that because like, I have no problem with a Jewish person believing that a derogatory word towards Jews is the worst word ever. Like, I'm a black man. Of course, I'm going to believe that the N word is like the worst word ever. And I don't, I don't understand why we don't think about, because what we should be thinking about is like, we're both minorities. So there are derogatory terms that are impactful. Yeah. And like, we should give each other grace. And I think you're right. When you meet someone who's different than you, the likely response is one of fear. But when you notice how similar we are, then the likely response is one of comfort. And I, I experienced that just as a black man, like it is what it is. But I can remember being in out of the country for a really long time. Now I try, well, not now because of the pandemic, but prior to the pandemic, I travel all the time. But I remember the first time being out of the United States for a very long time and in another country where they spoke another language. And I remember being dropped off at the airport after having spent however many days and weeks with translators and people who couldn't understand my language. And I had a connecting flight. So I was leaving, I think, Poland, and I was going to whatever country and then to the U.S. So I remember going to my gate, and there were a bunch of people who also didn't speak English. But there was this one guy who, he was a white guy, looked about my age, but like on the surface, we don't have a lot in common. But he had a shirt that said Army on it. And I approached him and I said, where are you from? And he said, Pennsylvania. And I remember experiencing a sense of relief that like what we have in common is we're Americans and English is our first language. And I jokingly said to him like, man, I haven't spoken to anybody for whom English is their first language in a couple of weeks. And he was like, yeah, me too. And I'm not someone, like I'm a very introverted person. Like I'm not someone who seeks out that type of comfort, but I was able to discern in that moment, our commonalities are more important than our differences. And I could draw comfort from our commonality. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I think one of the things that you actually made me think of is when I was teaching in academia, I, I had a doctoral student who I was her dissertation chair, right? So I was helping her to work on her dissertation. And she was working on a, a dissertation that has significantly impacted me and my view. I think it's of all of the dissertations that I've had a part of in helping with, her dissertation is the one that has stuck with me. And she was doing a qualitative study with Iraqi refugees, right? So Iraqi people who have come to the United States, who've been relocated to the United States because they are political refugees. Mm -hmm. And 
as she was interviewing these, these individuals, one of the things that came up in every single interview that she did is that these Iraqis would say, I experienced horrific things in my own country and I was physically in danger. I regularly didn't have enough food and there was violence all around us. And I was scared physically for our lives that people would come and kill us. And then they would come to the United States and she was looking at the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And she was saying, if parents had that kind of experience, what impact did that have on children? They would say, when I would come, when I came to this country, I thought things were gonna get better. And I was hopeful for my children. And one of the things that happened is that their children and they were treated horribly. And they were treated emotionally horribly. And they were told horrible things. And they were told things like, go back to your own country. And they were told things like, if you're in America, you should speak English. And they were belittled because of the way that they dressed. And in every single one of the interviews that she conducted, they all said, the emotional trauma that we have experienced in the United States is less desirable than the physical trauma we experienced in our own country. And every single one of them said, if I had the choice, I would choose to go back to Iraq and deal with that than to deal with what it is that we're dealing with. As I read their interviews, one of the things that struck me was, these are all parents. These are all people who are trying to make a better life for their children. These are all people who are trying to do something to make their lives better. And we, have done something to make their lives worse. Mm. And if we just took a moment, and if we saw them as parents, if we saw them as people who loved their children, if we saw them as people who were trying to live happy lives, even though they have experienced hardship, all of the sudden, that's something I can relate to. I can be a parent. I can love my children. I can want a good life for my family. And now there's something activated in me that makes me compassionate, that says we should go out of our way to be kind, to be accepting, to even have a conversation and say, can you tell me about the hard things that you've experienced? And is there anything I can do that could lift that load just a bit? Right. I think sometimes we forget that people are just people and they want the same things that we want. I think that's totally true. And I, I'm blown away at how often we forget that. Like going back to that interaction I had on social media, like as you were talking, like Adam, I've experienced emotional trauma as a result of these things. It is hard for me to reconcile the way that I am treated. I was treated in that specific incident and in a hundred others. But I think we just have to like remember that people are people. And I remember, I remember one time I was an undergrad and I hadn't been around a lot of out of the closet gay people. And this was a real huge moment that triggered compassion in me. Because I, I got to be honest, like something happened at 17, I was 17 years old. I don't know that I was comfortable around gay, or would have been, you know, I was 17. Look, just like you were saying, people are different and scary and all the, all the things. And I, I was at University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, and we had this responsibility to clean our suite. And once a week, the resident assistants, the RAs, would come through and check your suite to make sure it was clean and neat. And it was a huge thing, because if your suite was not clean, you got punished. We had to do like extra work in the in the building. And if your suite was clean, you did not get punished. But if you had like the cleanest suite, you got a pizza party. And 17-year-old kid playing football, like I want as much pizza as you can give me. That was um, how I was living at 17. And then one day, I had to go get the vacuum cleaner. And you, you get the vacuum cleaner from the resident assistant. You have to go like sign it out. 
And I went up to his dorm room. He, w- he was up one floor and I knock on his door and he opens the door and I see evidence that he is likely gay. I see pictures on the wall. Back in those days when there's no Instagram, people would like take pictures out of a magazine and like take them to their dorm wall. And I see all these pictures that he is likely gay, which I hadn't really thought of before. And I remember feeling uncomfortable as I go into his room and see all these pictures of clearly, and and I want to be clear, not pornography, but just gay romance on his walls. And I remember feeling uncomfortable and being like, man, just hurry up and give me the vacuum cleaner because I'm, I'm not comfortable seeing all these pictures or whatever. So I start chatting with him and I said, so how was your weekend? And he turned to me and then boom, starts crying. He just burst into tears and starts telling me how he went into Boston to surprise his boyfriend and found his boyfriend with another guy. And he says to me, like, can you talk for a minute? And I was like, sure. And he just tells me about how heart-wrenching that was. And he told me about how heartbroken he was and how he saw a future with this man and all these sorts of things. And I fully, full on remember sitting and thinking, man, gay people just like us. (laughs) Because if I went into Boston to surprise my girlfriend, I'd have the exact same response that this guy is having. And something about that moment like triggered compassion to me like, yeah, we're different in one particular way, but we both have hearts that are capable of being broken. So I'm comfortable. We ended up sitting, I sat on his floor and I honestly, I don't remember how much time passed, but like it was a long time. Like I sat on the floor talking about this for a very long time. And I remember the entire time, the differences between he and I completely melted away. And the similarity between he and I is we're both capable of love. We both want a romantic interest in our life. We both want to build a future where that romantic interest is a part of our lives in a meaningful kind of collaborative way. And all of a sudden the differences just didn't matter because we were just, we were just two people who are capable of having their heart broken. And like, regardless of who breaks it, whether it's a man or a woman or whether it's a same sex relationship or not, like having your heart broken sucks. And I'm so thankful for that experience because I think it changed me, actually. I think, like you talk about that dissertation sticking with you, that conversation has stuck with me. And not just like my thoughts about the LGBT community, but just my thoughts about people who are different. Because we're actually not that different. In the fundamental, like breaking it down as to who we are, like perhaps the differences are myths. Mm. And perhaps the similarities are much more important. And I can't help but think about like, comparing a human being DNA to like an orangutan, where the similarities are 98.6, something like that, between a human being and an orangutan. And if that's true, if we have that much in common genetically from a DNA perspective with an orangutan, how much in common do you think Elliot Connie has with Adam Thrower? Mm. We pro- it's like 99.9999999, but yet we spend so much time focused on the 0.000001 when like maybe the rest of the content is actually where we would put our focus. The simple truth is that gay guy whom I sat on the floor with, what I learned in that moment was we're all the same. Differences are minute and irrelevant. And in some cases, just myths, just flat out untruths. Yeah, you actually remind me too, I I was reading a book that the Dalai Lama helped to, to write. And one of the things that he, he comes back to several times is he says, you know, too much formality makes us different. And obviously, you know, I think about the Dalai Lama and I think he's such an amazing person who has spent so much time bettering himself. And I would put him up on a pedestal, right? And one of the things that he talks about is as he goes and he meets people, various people, one of the things that he does is that he puts his forehead on their foreheads. And he says, I just touch foreheads with them. And that's what helps me to remember, I am just one of 7 billion people. And I think sometimes we put people above us and sometimes we put people below us. And either way, we're doing ourselves and we are doing that other person an injustice, right? right? Whether we're putting them above us or whether we're putting them below us, we're making them different. And I think if we could all hold on to that sentiment from the Dalai Lama of we're just one of 7 billion people, all of the sudden, what 
what is similar about me and what's similar about you becomes vastly more important than what makes us better or worse than or different than another person. Yeah, I think that that is like profoundly true. And again, I think about the movie Independence Day. There's another scene in that movie where like they're all stuck in rubble and, you know, everybody's like stuck. And and um, the fact that one of the people stuck was the first lady is now irrelevant because there's nobody higher or lower than anybody else. Like we're all just trying to survive. And on some level, whether we're stuck in rubble or not, that's true. Like we're all just trying to survive. We're all just trying to carve out our place in this blue ball that's spinning around the universe. And we need to just remember that. Like everybody you meet is just like you, just trying to carve out their place. And we need to give people compassion. So what I wanna, here's, here's my thing. Compassion is actually a very common thing. And as Adam and I both indicated, sometimes it has to be triggered in you. Like Adam reading that dissertation triggered his compassion because he was like, oh my God, we're all just parents trying to like raise happy, healthy kids. And I talked about an incident where I got triggered by spending some time with someone who had a different sexual preference than I had. But I want to encourage all of you guys listening to this podcast to look for opportunities to have your compassion triggered and to demonstrate compassion for other people because it matters. And I think what we need more of in this world is compassion. I think that's a, that we need more compassion in this world so people feel more heard and more valued. And one other request, if you are getting anything out of this podcast, if you're getting anything out of these conversations that Adam and I are having, would you please A, leave a comment wherever you're listening to this podcast, whether it's on my YouTube channel, on my website, on any of the podcasting platforms, and also share this podcast because we we believe very much in what we're saying. We believe very much in wanting to make a difference in this world, and we need your help to do that and to reach more people. So if you're getting anything out of these conversations, leave a comment below in whichever platform in which you're consuming this podcast and share this on your social media platforms. We would love for this to reach more people. And one of the things that, that just frightens me about the human experience is if we had a horrible conversation, if Adam were to like insult me, call me the N word or something like that, this podcast would go viral because people would be like, have you seen the video of the white guy attacking the black guy on his podcast? I want a conversation about compassion to go equally viral. Like I want a, a conversation about making the world a better, more safe place for more people to have an equally likelihood of going viral. And we can't, we can't do that without your help. So if you're getting anything out of this podcast, leave a comment and share it and help us, help us spread hope, optimism, and positivity with the same passion that other people are spreading hate. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Adam, for having this conversation, bro. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, we 